Okay, ladies and gentlemen, how are you this evening? I'd like to give you a little background on our guest speaker that One Struggle has invited today. He was with Progressive Democrats of America, but we won't hold that against him. <laughs> I know him personally from Occupy Fort Lauderdale, which he was very active in the Occupy movement. But the biggest thing that Brian's been doing lately is Blog Talk Radio. He has a radio show every Monday night at 10 p.m. It's a fantastic show. It's called Progress Toward Democracy. And he's had famous uh, people that he's interviewed, like Noam Chomsky and e economist Richard Wolff, just as two examples. Hey, folks. So you can listen to that radio show anytime on blogtalkradio.com. You don't just have to listen to it live on Monday nights at 10. So without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Brian Stetton. Brian, before we get started, I want yes. to ask anybody here objects to have their picture taken. Oh yes, does anyone object to having a picture taken? Because it may appear online or you something. You object, they just want to take your and picture. You, yeah. And if I happen to take your picture next to someone, I will not put it on Facebook or anything like that. Are you already cool with that? You can proceed to the front. Cool. So, hello everybody. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it really is. Uh, well, I, I guess I'll start with uh, the way I usually start, which is mentioned that in our society, uh, uh, we have uh, basically uh, uh, a rich elite class, upper class, ruling class, whatever you want to call it, that periodically members compete with each other uh, to determine who gets to control the state for their own best interests. And uh, we, we call those periods of competition elections and, uh, and are sort of pulled into thinking that we have something that's uh, kind of a democracy. There was an interesting work uh, published by a political scientist just within the past few years, was a, by a Thomas Edsel on the politics of inequality, uh, in which he described how basically if you look at the voting patterns of Congress, uh, pretty much if, uh, if you break down uh, what the population wants on polls by income quartiles, it's like the bottom half pretty much don't get represented in Congress at all. They don't get anything they want, up to 70% uh, quartile. Uh, they may get some of what they want, and as you go to the 90th percentile, uh, people in that high income range pretty much get whatever they want from Congress. And uh, so it, it truly is a, a plutocratically run society. Uh, the Brian? only time it seems to... Go ahead, yes. When did we last have a democracy? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't think ever. Yeah, okay. no, but, yeah we'll have, oh yeah, uh, basically, well, uh, yeah, let me talk about it. I mean, basically, I'm going to, uh, uh, well, we'll have a, a discussion afterward. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the structure of the um, as I talk, you know, but, I mean, unless there's something urgent, a question you have to get out, you know, I guess. But, uh, so, yeah, but basically, so we, it, we it, it's never, I mean, the only time it seems to shift a little bit more toward the masses is around election time. Then perhaps the politicians have to pay some attention to their voters, and in between the elections, none. So that skews those statistics more than anything else. But I'm going to be talking about a specific subclass of uh, the, uh, the investor class. Before I do that, though, I came across a really cool article. I don't know if any of you are familiar with David Frum. Uh, David Frum is a, uh, basically, he used to be a very popular conservative. I mean, he started off, he had a long future. He was with APAC, uh, then he worked for the Manhattan Institute, which is a conservative think tank. And then he became a speech writer for George W. Bush. Uh, he's most famous for the, the great Axis of Evil speech, if you remember that. Uh, and uh, was uh, remarkably popular uh, up until, uh, just a matter of a few years ago, uh, I would say uh, he was critical to how his party was reacting to the health care debate, and he criticized Fox News as uh, running the Republican Party where the Republican Party should be running them, and uh, he got fired from the American Enterprise Institute, and you know, it was considered a disgrace and so forth, but he was still writing for uh, Daily Beast. and. Uh, and I was uh, reading this most recent and apparently last piece. He's apparently taking a break from writing anything because of family issues. Uh, but he wrote a, a column and he stated, one of the lessons I think conservatives should take from the 2012 Mitt Romney defeat 
is that the increasing concentration of wealth in America has dangerous political and intellectual consequences. And uh, he goes on to state, I'm not so worried that the oligarchs will pay for apologetics on their behalf. That's politics as usual. So in other words, you know, he expects the, the wealthy to buy the politics. That's normal for him. But he, but he states, as a, I'm more concerned that so many people will identify themselves with the interests of the oligarchy without being paid. That was uh, interesting. So he's worried that people will start lobbying for the rich for free because everyone is so ideologically entranced by Fox News and so forth, and everyone's sort of in a bubble reality. But it seems to be the way we're going. I mean, we have a, a class of elites that uh, fervently believe, and, uh, and they brainwash themselves in their own ideology and so forth. And that's particularly true among uh, this subset of the elites that I'm going to talk about. Uh, I guess the financial elites in particular, hedge fund managers and private equity managers. And uh, I thought I'd start off yeah, going it. from the uh, specific to the general and then back to the specifics again. Uh, and uh, in particular, here's a because I want to make the point of how are these hedge fund managers, I just want to pass it that pool, uh, distort our society. And uh, so recently on TV, which some of you are, are smart enough to try to not to watch, uh, there's been a television ads for uh, a company called K-12. K-12 is an online school, which is supposed to be a substitute for basically kindergarten on up, all online. And it's, uh, you know, the, the giving the parent a, a choice as that as public education rather than going to a public school. You know, that's the, the valid choice. And they've been spending very heavily on advertising. You go into the article there, uh, let's see, it mentions that television advertising on CNN, the Cartoon Network, I don't know what vampirefreaks.com is. Came across another article that mentions uh, Nickelodeon, uh, so they're, they're targeting the kiddies. Uh, let's see, K-12 spent about $21.5 million on TV ads in just the first eight months of 2012. Now, this is a publicly traded company, uh, so it had an initial public offering of stock, uh, funds raised from that stock, were any of those funds used for that advertising, the marketing costs? No, they used taxpayer dollars. So this advertising expense was taxpayer dollars. Taxpayer dollars that could have been spent on the teachers themselves or teaching material or something like that was spent on television ads that appear on the Cartoon Network that's still, uh, uh, I don't know, what's a famous uh, uh, favorite cartoon on the Cartoon Network? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, yeah, Adult Swim, you have uh, Adult Swim, yeah. Anyway, uh, I mean, that, that I thought was very interesting. If you, if you look further into it, uh, you see that some of the biggest shareholders of this stock, there's a website called InsideMonkeys.com, which uh, they try to look at what are called 13F filings. You know, when a money manager develops such a large position in a stock so that they become a significant holder, they have to file for that. And so, uh, so uh, you know, if you look hard enough, that can become public information. And you have uh, some fairly sizable companies uh, become uh, fairly significant holders of that stock. Uh, the Stadium Capital Management, D.E. Shaw, Island Capital, Citadel Investment Group. So it's uh, basically the hedge fund managers have uh, played a way of uh, uh, played a role in lobbying the politicians to get what they want uh, regarding uh, this uh, massive corporate welfare uh, to these companies, taxpayer funds, to, uh, in this case, virtual charter schools. And uh, they're doing what they can to guarantee themselves a return. And I'll, in a little bit, I'll tell you why, too. It has to do with uh, their incentive structure and so forth. Uh, but, uh, let me pass this out too, because uh, they've been 
very open about it. This article, Charter Schools New Cheerleaders Financiers. Okay. I mean, the hedge funds have been really boasting about uh, their, their uh, interest in the growth of uh, charter schools. I mean, this is, this is one area where they, they, can't seem to, uh, they can't seem to shut up about it, basically. Uh, it's it's uh, pretty interesting. Uh, I mean, this article, uh, at one point, the writer states at the very beginning, hedge fund executives are the energy as the first significant political counterweight to the powerful teachers unions. You know, we know in reality just how so-called powerful the teacher unions really are, you know. But it's, uh, I mean, they, they boast about it. Uh, there was an article, uh, Business Insider, I think, uh, uh, let me look up the title of it really quick, that was, uh, had a kind of a funny title, uh, Business Insider. It's a badge of honor to be attacked by thuggish teachers unions. You know, this is kind of funny. Uh, Dan Loeb is a hedge fund manager. It was uh, quite an interesting character, actually. I like the way Matt Taibbi describes him. Uh, he's a writer for the Rolling Stone that comments frequently in financial matters, and uh, and he has a he doesn't mince words. He he basically describes Dan Loeb as the the second biggest asshole on Wall Street. Uh, the first he, he designates to Stephen Cohen of SAC Capital Management, who's been trading on lots of inside information, and if he goes, and Dan Loeb will, I guess, take his place. Dan Loeb is uh, known for berating uh, CEOs of corporate companies very publicly uh, when he takes positions in those companies. Uh, that's how he gets his return. Uh, he. Uh, this is a one famous story where he, he saw, uh, he went to some tennis match game or something like that, and uh, one of the CEOs was uh, uh, having a shrimp cocktail enjoying the game, and basically Dan Lopes saw the guy that went up to him, started cursing him out, and, you know, you're supposed to be making me money, not here, you know, eating a shrimp cocktail, eating fat slaw. It's kind of interesting. One hedge fund manager said, I'm surprised the CEO hasn't murdered a guy. Uh, so it's, it's a, he's a character, of course, it's hard for us to feel too bad for CEOs that make tens of thousands of dollars an hour, uh, but these hedge fund managers tend to be even higher on the food chain than that. But Dan Loeb, anyway, going back to the initial example, was pitching uh, various teachers' pension plans to give him his money. You know, I want to manage your assets, these are my services. And, these are the type of returns I shoot for and so forth. And, uh, and they found out that while he was doing this, an organization that he was indirectly involved with was lobbying heavily and also printing, and you could go on the website and so forth, and pushing material that pension plans should be rid of, we should get rid of them altogether. Teachers union shouldn't have them. So he's attacking the very pension plans that he was pitching to. That was kind of interesting. The organization uh, in particular was called Students First, a website, studentsfirst.org. Uh, studentsfirst.org, uh, he founded the organization, and he's on the uh, board of directors of this organization. And Students First uh, puts it Students First by pushing the notion that students would be so much better off if we privatized the public educational system and replaced it with charter schools, of course. And it's uh, run by uh, a former chancellor of, I believe, the Washington School, D.C. School District area, Chancellor of Education, um, her name being uh, Michelle Ray. Hello. Hi. So basically, this, uh, this organization was also pushing against uh, pension plans for the teachers, uh, uh, insisting that they should be replaced by a cash balance program or something like that. And so they questioned Dan Loeb about it, and he said, I don't know what you're talking about, I'm remotely connected to this organization, don't really pay attention to what they do, and so forth. Of course, he lied. I founded the damn thing. 
Uh, but he said, go ask Michelle Ray if you have an issue about it, uh, was basically his answer. Uh, uh, Paul Tudor is another uh, hedge fund manager that uh, similarly has been uh, trying to attract the money. Paul Tudor Jones and Tudor Investment Corp has been trying to attack the, uh, or has attracted the money of the Ohio Teachers Retirement Plan. And uh, he also spends money heavily uh, on organizations pushing for more charter schools. You know, so it's, uh, I mean, the capitalism is uh, screwing over the people that uh, uh, have built up the capital in a sense. It's a, uh, it was a notion of pension plan capital, uh, which I'll mention that briefly later too. Uh, basically, as labor was building up funds in pension plans, those pension assets were uh, used and leveraged buyout funds and so forth, which turned around and attacked the labor that was saving up for its own retirement. You know, in other words, uh, funds that played a role in buying out companies and dismantling them and laying, doing mass layoffs of the workers were done in part by funds that came from their own pension plans. You know, I mean, so you had that bizarre, you know, uh, uh, feature of contradiction of capitalism in there. You know. Whitney Tilson is a hedge fund manager who uh, claims to be a raving liberal, actually. Uh, he was one of the uh, money bundlers. Actually, so was Dan Loeb for the first term. He was a money bundler for Obama. Uh, Whitney Tilson, he wasn't a fundraiser for Obama, but he made a bet, I guess, that Obama would win the second time around. So he was a fan throughout the whole nine yards. But he stated, uh, unions' motives are clear to all to protect their own self-interest at the expense of children. So, I mean, they all have this. And, of course, he sits on... Uh, the board of directors of a company called KIPP New York, which again is a charter school company there. So I mean they all have this strong self-interest. Uh, they don't see any issues with it. They're financially benefiting from it. They're, they take positions in uh, the related stocks of companies that become public that are related to it. Um, uh, teachers Union was pushing the pension plan management to boycott these hedge fund, these hedge funders, we may call them briefly, uh, and uh, the hedge funders uh, and, re and, re and they, this is in the news, uh, they basically uh, accused uh, the teachers unions of uh, McCarthyism. You know, uh, geez, they're trying to attack us for our political beliefs. I mean, it's my own business if I give to students first or something like that. You know, it's uh, but businesses and others. It's you know, it's such McCarthy. It, it's and I, and I think they actually believe what they're saying. You know, it's it's kind of a bizarre, psychotic, you know, edge to their behavior. Um, you know, so I thought that was uh, the whole charter school experience is a, a very interesting example. One of one of the uh, other reasons why. The, private money has been going after it is uh, due to a tax law that was put in place by Bill Clinton called the New Market Tax Credit. So it's a 39% tax credit that allows you to double your money in seven years. So that was a benefit that was already in place that was used for these charter schools. And also attracting foreign money because if you can get, uh, say, a rich investor overseas to invest at least half a million dollars he automatically has bought visas for his entire family. Mm. You know, so it's uh, so you have all this corporate welfare built into it. You know, it's it's uh, something that Dean Baker describes as a uh, you know as you have the elite saying we have a, a nanny state that we want for us, but uh, they constantly want to curtail you know any type of welfare state or social safety nets for the rest of us. Uh, what exactly are hedge funds? Uh, well, hedge funds are basically unregulated uh, investment management companies. Uh, there's uh, investment management companies were regulated in 1940, meaning they have to be sold by a prospectus. 
Uh, most of you have heard of mutual funds. So you have a, a money manager or managing a portfolio of stock or bonds or something of that ilk. Uh, unit investment trust is a type of investment company uh, that consists of a fixed portfolio of which they sell shares of and a uh, closed end fund which issues out a certain number of shares that trade on the New York Stock Exchange and, uh, and uh, basically they also invest in a fixed portfolio and uh, uh, for stock or bonds and basically either the underlying net asset value, the valuation per share, would appreciate due to the underlying appreciation of the portfolio, or if it's a portfolio of bonds, you're buying these shares for income. Actually, I got caught up in uh, selling one when I was a broker once, which uh, was a bad scandal, uh, although they didn't talk about it that way, it was a closed-end bond fund. And this was at the time, this was at the time that was uh, just around the time that the Glass-Steagall Act, the, uh, that paper wall between investment and commercial banking was broken. And, uh, and they wanted us to market this closed-end bond fund to elderly people. It was basically it's supposed to be a safe portfolio. And uh, at that time, uh, they were saying, well, Glass-Steagall's been broken. And, you know, you know, you're, you know, they would point out to the you know, the older brokers that managed to avoid the firm's own handmade products. Um, uh, and you know, the the older brokers, at Dean Witter, for example, uh, you know, would try to keep very safe investments to their elderly clients. You know, a municipal bond here and there, a broker certificate of deposit, a very high quality corporate bond, or something like that. And so anything with bells and whistles, you know, they've been burnt before. But they were told, listen, now you're going to be competing with the banks. The banks are going to start having their own brokers in their branches, which they do now. And they're going to be pitching your clients. They could be selling them this. So you have to push it to your first. Let me uh, draw something on the board real quick. So basically, yeah, they would issue a, you know, shares of stock. Uh, as an IPO, let's say $10 a share, and use the proceeds to buy a bunch of muni bonds. Uh, and so you, they, you, you take all the income that's being generated from those muni bonds, and you issue it out to the shareholders. And then they would try to use leverage. Leverage means you make a loan, right? But in the case of a closed-end bond fund, they would uh, issue up more debt, but uh, more of this, uh, this debt was a uh, very short-term debt. Uh, commercial paper, uh, commercial paper is uh, any type of loan or bond that matures in less than 360 days. So it can mature overnight or a week, just like US Treasury bills, a T-bill, one month, three months, six months, okay. So these would issue out of these would pay out a very low rate of interest, like one percent. But you know they sold these out at an auction, and then uh, the proceeds would be used to buy more muni bonds. So they pay out most of the income to the holders of this common shares, which is what these brokers sold, and then a, a portion, a small portion of that they would give out to people that would buy this short-term paper at some auction, and so that they call that on fund leverage. And well, Alan Greenspan decided to raise interest rates on the fear of inflation. And so the interest rates on the short term paper had to go up. And if you have to increase the interest rates in the short term paper, that means you have to cut the dividend that's going out to the common shareholders, cut the dividends that are going to the old people that we sold this shit to. Okay, and uh, basically they also turn out put into the portfolio of vehicles called interest rate floaters to enhance the income. Inverse floaters, some obscure derivative I still don't understand, it's sort of like a futures contract, but they pay out the yield that's inverse to the yield curve. Needless to say that when interest rates start going up, those things went complete crap. So we had this IPO 
which was rated by Standard and Poor's, by the way, and Moody's as triple A. Wow. No, yeah. It's triple A. And uh, the valuation collapsed from $10 a share to $6 a share, and the dividend was slashed. And, you know, well, so how do you like your alternative to a bank safe certificate of deposit, Mrs. Jones? Don't sue me. <laughs> so I mean, it's just, uh, yeah. And that's Dean Witter and Merrill Lynch did it. All the big brokers firms do it. And nobody got in any kind of trouble or anything. I think there were some lawsuits. But I mean, this is like an everyday occurrence at those damn firms, right? And this is well before any of the big scams that we've had recently. Yeah. Uh, so that's the nature of the industry. That's a closed-end bond fund. So those are investment management companies. Another type of investment management company is what's called a real estate investment trust. A uh, real estate investment trust uh, publicly trades just like a regular corporation does. Uh, it's supposed to invest primarily in real estate and pay out at least 90% of his net income as a dividend to the shareholder. So it's another income alternative to the investor, but of course, so you can you know, it can grow or decline just like a company can, depending on its portfolio of real estate, right? A lot of the real estate companies are uh, like apartment management companies, for example. Uh, they have a tax benefit, by the way. They don't have to pay a corporate tax. That's kind of a nice benefit to them. No corporate tax. Um, so they have apartment multi-housing REITs. Uh, some of you may have noticed uh, that uh, if you follow the home pricing market, all the home price valuations went off a cliff and they started coming back. But then there's stories that, uh, oh wow, uh, apparently hedge funds, private equity funds, and banks have been buying up homes. Mm -hmm. Well, they have been. They've been buying up the homes and they're becoming landlords. And just recently, there has been uh, IPOs, initial public offerings, of uh, these single family home REITs coming to market. Uh, a big one just came to market a few weeks ago. American Homes 4 rent with the number 4 for that for one. You know. uh, so basically, the hedge funds and so forth are exiting and trying to get as much money as they can, bringing these issues to market as we sort of moved to this bizarre type of neo feudalism where they've gone from just lending the money to outright owning the homes. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Also, an interesting thing that happened within the REIT market within the past year, excuse me, I'm getting awfully drawn, is that uh, prison management companies have converted the REIT structure. Now your primary business when you're a publicly traded real estate investment trust is to be real estate oriented. You know, you're renting space. So you have office property REITs, uh, home REITs, apartment REITs, and now you have prison REITs. Corrections Corporation of America, right, and a uh, local one, GEO Corporation, those are the two biggest uh, prison management companies in the country, have converted to a real estate structure. They're both now REITs. That just happened within the past year. I thought it was kind of surreal, but I guess that's what the market is saying. This is, these are your future publicly traded housing companies. Prisons, you know, apartments, uh, single family homes. It's strange. But they also did it primarily to have a tax benefit. You don't have to pay corporate tax. You know, they're going to save tens of millions of dollars, it's been estimated. That's why they made that structural change. But it's, it's uh, I thought it was bizarre. Okay, let's get to hedge funds. Well, those can be bought by anybody that's uh, an investor. Uh, if it's a new issue, like a, an IPO, you have to buy. You have to be sold by a prospectus, which is some thick legal document that most people find unreadable for good reason, which details all the risk. Mutual funds are called open-ended companies because they are a perpetual new issue. They're always issuing out new shares and closing as people redeem their shares. So they're always sold by a pr uh, prospectus and have either a fee up front, fr uh, front and load, back end load or a, a fat marketing fee called a 12B1 fee attached to the internal management fee. Uh, um, 80 to 90% of them underperform the market anyway. So you're better off with John Bogle's Vanguard <coughs> index fund or something if you really want a whole fund in the stock market for the longer term. Um, hedge funds structure themselves a little bit differently. 
They typically have a, a dual fee structure, uh, typically an internal management fee, which again is an annual fee to, as a percentage of assets taken out of two, say two percent. Plus, uh, they take a percentage of the profit they call the high water market, like 220. It's a very common fee structure. So they are incentivized to 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 grab a percentage of the re, you know, the return of the profit. And so if they can structure a deal to make sure that it gives them a, a profit, like any good capitalist, you're damn well going to do it, right? And so if we go back to K-12, for example, you definitely want to put things in your favor by making sure, for example, uh, the government guarantees it'll pay for the advertising of taxpayer dollars or something. You want to guarantee as much as possible because you want to guarantee a return to guarantee your investors. Hedge funds also not regulated, not regulated at all. Um, it's uh, really the only, there's only one main regulation that at least 65% of the investors have to be what's called accredited, meaning worth at least a million dollars or uh, have an annual income of $200,000 if you're single, $300,000 if you're married. That's uh, the current IRS definition of accredited investor. Um, and they, hedge funds actually make sure they more than cover that. Most hedge funds don't have one non-accredited investor in there. They're deadly scared of crossing that line and having someone, you know, scream that they've lost money in it when they uh, are a poor, lowly investor. Hedge fund managers typically put most of their own money into it. That's usually a selling point. See, I have my own savings in there. You should join me. Um, so, you know, that, that, that's pretty much the basics of uh, hedge funds. Um, I do want to mention something about the hierarchy of uh, hedge funds. Where are they in the scheme of things? And so let me backtrack a little bit of that uh, in regards to where they are in, in, in the, I would say, in the lineup of elites. Um, uh, if we look at the 2,000 largest multinational, transnational corporations, there was an article, actually a cover story, for uh, it was a Fortune magazine last month, the 2,000 companies that control the world. That's about right. And uh, if you look at those 2,000 companies, uh, altogether they have about 70 to 75 million employees. And uh, something that David Rothkopf talked about in his book, Superclass, that if you add in all the family members of those employees, you can knock that up to about 200, 250 million people, say, uh, whose lives are directly influenced by 2,000 rich elite CEOs, right? Now, each of those companies has uh, other companies that act as vendors to those companies. They sell products to those companies uh, or they uh, help distribute the company's goods. So if you look at that, like in the Procter family, uh, family of companies that distribute or act as vendors to Procter & Gamble, there's about 35,000 companies. So if you throw in those employees and those family members, you can come up with about a billion people whose lives are influenced in some way by the decision of 2,000 CEOs. And that's of a world of seven billion people where only uh, us top two, two and a half billion people do anything that can be remotely called making a living. And uh, as you go down the ladder, uh, Four billion people, the uh, majority of them live on five dollars a day, go down to the last, you know, the bottom two billion or so, then less than two dollars a day. So those people have never even heard of a ringtone. Uh, so going on the back up, those 2,000 CEOs, well, they have to answer to somebody too, right? And uh, their performance, their pay, uh, their future, their livelihood is determined by the price of their stock, right? their company's stock. 30 to 50 percent of the stock's volume on the big board on any given day is volume that's from a hedge fund. Right? Right. There's only about 10,000 hedge funds in the world. 
actually. And uh, of those hedge funds, about 300 hedge funds have 85% of the assets. Of those 300 hedge funds, 100 of those hedge funds have 60% of the assets. So as you get to the top, you have this immense concentration of wealth, you know, where you have a few people whose lives are extremely influential on others. So Steve Cohen, for example, two years ago, he made three billion in one year. You had like three hedge fund managers each made three billion in one year. You know, so I mean here, so whereas you have, say, Mike Duke, the CEO of Walmart making, say, $16,000 an hour relative to his average worker, which is making $7.25 an hour, you have a number of hedge fund managers that are making about a million dollars an hour. A million dollars an hour, that's just kind of amazing. You know, it's like, what on, I don't know what on earth justifies making $16,000 an hour, but at a million dollars an hour, I would say, by lunchtime, you have better cured cancer <laughs> and by dinner time, world peace. I mean, you, know, you better have done something, but no, you know. Anyway, there's a, I can't remember the character's name, but uh, there's a popular online libertarian show, I, uh, How the World Works, I think it's called, or something. It's, I find it painful to watch, but so I like to see what <laughs> people are being propagandized. You know, I, I like to see what the propaganda is, so I, We'll put myself through that. <laughs> and and, and uh, so I, and I gather he commented, and uh, I don't see why anyone would complain about it. These guys have achieved the American dream. You know, it's just, and it, it struck me as odd. Because uh, a few videos earlier, it was, uh, you know, uh, teachers are just uh, lazy people that don't deserve their $50,000 a year. It's, that's too much money. You know, that makes no sense to me. I think, mean, again, we have this bizarre dialectics, but is there a contradiction here? Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. Uh, well, how, how, did we, uh, how did we get to this point? Uh, with uh, How am I doing on time? I don't want to get too little carried away. 7.45. 7.45? Okay. Uh, well, uh, basically, uh, I, I would say the shift from industrial capitalism to finance capitalism and the power of the sector is uh, how these characters appeared here, appeared here in the first place. I mean, you go back to the very beginning of this country, Madison made it very clear at the Constitutional Convention uh, that uh, the purpose of this government should be to protect the opulent minority from the, the vast majority. In other words, to protect property owners, the rich. And that's how he structured the Constitution. And it's been pretty much run along like that all the way along. Uh, but our industrial revolution late, started in the late 1800s. That's when what we think of industrial capitalism officially came onto the scene. And uh, by the end of World War I, uh, capitalism was pretty damn unpopular. But we don't think of it that way now. It was very unpopular. And there's a very good reason why, uh, like a matter of decades after that, a third of the world was under a brand name ideology called communism. I mean, that occurred because if you go back earlier than that, uh, people have pretty much had it. Massive uh, income inequality. Uh, and there wasn't any such thing as a middle class back then. Uh, but then when you get to uh, uh, the time of the New Deal, I mean, we virtually had our wealthy class uh, being very scared of the possibility of a socialist revolution. And uh, uh, Roosevelt there was able to negotiate for uh, uh, saving capitalism, basically a compromise between labor and capital. So we had more protections for labor, start to evolve laws to protect labor unions. You had the beginnings of our uh, welfare state for the people, the social safety nets. Um, you had uh, the Bretton Wood Pact, which formed the IMF. World Bank and uh, World Trade Organization, but the most important aspect as far as us domestically, uh, those organizations were pretty harsh to uh, third world countries in their own way, uh, was capital controls. Uh, they, uh, you know, you had tariffs in place and uh, particularly targeting the financiers and the banks. 
limitations as to amount of capital can be transferred out into the country. So for example, if the elite were scared of uh, uh, more taxes because of some program, they couldn't just fly their money out of a country. You know, I mean, capital controls sort of give the population a breathing space. That's how Noam Chomsky puts it. Um, and uh, all, as well as a very progressive tax rate. Uh, so if you look at it in today's dollars, um, say a millionaire uh, had a top tax bracket of 91%. So you know, regular tax rate on the first whatever millions, I think anything over three million was taxed at, uh, at 91 cents on the dollar. And that stayed that way for quite some time. It stayed that way until Kennedy. And he dropped it to 70%. But anyway, so after World War II, this resulted in the, uh, the formation of a very broad middle class. Uh, and now it's kind of interesting that we have the politicians talk about saving the middle class. And on both sides they do, really. Just one has uh, some uh, suggestions that have something to do with reality, even though they still pretty much enrich the elite, and the other ones are just out for lunch. But I mean, they both used to the, you know, protect the middle class. I mean, the, the, the big middle class was kind of an anomaly, um, and uh, we're kind of going back to where we were before that. You know, it, it, it's fading away. I mean, they started attacking it shortly thereafter, as soon as we got the President Truman, with the passage of the Taft-Hartley Act, which allowed the existence of what we call states like uh, Florida, what is it, uh, right to work states, uh, making certain types of union shops illegal, restrictions on, on uh, certain types of striking and so forth. You go to 1971 and you have, uh, and you have uh, the removal of capital controls by Richard Nixon. You know, I mean, we had, we had good growth, so let me pass that a hand up regarding that, by the way. We had uniform growth of uh, Income. And most of you know this, I'm sure. So it's, it's always good to look at it again in a different perspective. You know, it's uh, both both rich and uh, poor. So incomes grow uh, up until the 1970s, and then as we head on, it starts to decline. And then as we go to the 80s, uh, incomes for everybody pretty much stagnated down. But incomes for the people in the top one percent go up, you know, about four hundred percent, while productivity continues to climb and climb. You know, and, and you saw this change in labor participation rates over that period of time too, because if you go back to the fifties, it was primarily single-income families. You know, so you had the husband do the work, have a good job, but they'd be able to afford two cars, a uh, car for himself, a car for his wife, the wife would stay at home, look after the kids, they could afford their mortgage, they could afford health insurance. Right. And then it became two income families, now it's becoming three income families actually, with college students living home, multi-family incomes. I came across one article talking about people getting together and buying a home together, mm -hmm. you know, and stuff like that. Uh, so it's, we, we tend to be growing in that range. And actually, uh, Michael Hudson, an economist, made an interesting projection. That he believes that by the year 2020, women will have to work 18 hours a day, and you'll have to start sending your children to work at the age of three. <laughs> so he says, you want to have kids, have them now, because if you wait, you're going to have to send them to work at the age of three. You know? And it's uh, no job, actually. Um, so, so what's going on here? Well. Uh, let me pass out this other article to get the detail of that. So as we go through this period, what happened? Uh, well, let me restate that. Okay. Income for labor declining, or should I even call it labor share of income? Uh, well, up until, you know, originally, before New Deal, uh, the top 1% had about 16% of the nation's income. 
And then throughout the 50s and 60s, uh, their share of income becomes 8% of the country's income. So they're hurting, you know, because uh, it's, uh, you know, I mean, you're only uh, powerful, you're not super wonderful powerful, I guess. So it's, uh, so uh, it almost seems like by design, policies were put through. But basically we had a uh, stagflation in the 1970s. It could have been caused by a number of issues. Uh, uh, we had uh, a lot of debt because of the Vietnam War, which some feel overvalued uh, the dollar. Uh, Nixon removed the dollar gold peg as well as removing capital controls. Um, uh, and we had the oil crisis, which increased prices but uh, would also increase growth, as, you know, I mean, decreased growth. So uh, employment was, you had uh, mounting unemployment, uh, prices going up, so it was stagflation, it was kind of miserable. Uh, you had uh, people pushing these harsh neoliberal ideas, like Milton Friedman from the Chicago School, uh, Hayek, and so forth. Uh, those ideas were out there and conservative think tanks, which have been pushing these ideas for years. And they were embraced, this radical free market ideology, which started Nixon and his trend. And uh, Jimmy Carter, uh, for example, picked up Paul Volcker as his uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve. And Volcker uh, was uh, very much you know, a student, a uh, follower of Milton Friedman's, and uh, believed uh, that the way to control inflation and so forth was raising interest rates and through what he called Volcker shocks, raise interest rates a number of times, up to 20% at one point. And uh, by raising interest rates, it was believed uh, that you can uh, bring the value of the dollar to a more sensible valuation, encourage people to save and so forth, increase demand for the dollar. Um, but it decimated labor. This was uh, Reagan reappointed Volcker. This policy continued. Labor got far more decimated. Uh, and then Reagan picks Alan Greenspan uh, to be his uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve. After that, uh, Alan Greenspan had worked for Reagan and Carter before, I guess, as uh, uh, doing a commission studying what should be done about Social Security. And uh, Alan Greenspan himself turns out to be a right-wing ideologue and uh, a friend and student of Ayn Rand, who was a radical individualist and a capitalist fanatic. And uh, so Reagan was very much against Social Security's existence at all. He strongly believed it should be privatized and uh, believed that uh, Ronald Reagan should at least reform Social Security so that it's more like an insurance contract and not like a welfare benefit to the people. Um, so Reagan dramatically cuts tax rates from 70% all the way down to 28% to the top tax bracket. Takes us on a course that balloons out our debt by $4 trillion, which is kind of amazing. Um, starts attacking social programs, uh, defunds a popular welfare program by half. I've got, I've got a mental block on the name of it, but it was a program that existed before what is now known as TANF, which is kind of a failure, of the only cash disbursement program we have for basically poor single mothers. You now, that's not what the program was before. Um, And, uh, and, and basically uh, raises taxes, uh, raises the payroll tax several times. So for the lower and middle class, the, uh, the tax decrease, because uh, you know, it gives the rich a huge tax decrease and gives everybody else a small income tax decrease. And so everybody's there, yay, Reagan's a hero. And in the meantime, those same middle class people so the payroll tax increase. So the payroll tax increase pretty much offsets the income tax decrease. So the low, the lower class and middle class get completely screwed, don't seem to realize it. Uh, and the payroll tax in the meantime is incredibly regressive. You know, and frankly, 
uh, recently, uh, this past year, we had as a stimulus, Obama put in a payroll tax cut, and uh, wasn't even really talked about till after the fact. Uh, uh, it was promoted more that well, Obama is doing this heroic thing by challenging the rich elites by raising the top tax bracket to what it was in the Clinton era. What was it by 35% to 37% or something? In the meantime, the payroll tax cut that we were given uh, just expired. That was basically a 45% tax increase mm -hmm. on the lower and middle class. Just experienced a 45% tax increase. Walmart sales and a bunch of other stores, they reported their revenue within this past week. And they see it too, it's hurting. Um, and uh, basically, they knew this was coming, uh, but you know they had to please the, the financial sector, I guess. Which, when you look at the stock market, that's the only portion of the market that's doing well. Yeah. Yeah. So, if you if you go back throughout the beginning of the thing, uh, throughout this whole process, the banks become more and more empowered, uh, and more and more by basically leveraging assets, enhancing the value of assets by making loans. Um, I mean, so to the point where, you know, our own lives are heavily leveraged. I mean, the average worker in this day and age pays 40% of his income for the roof over his head. Whether you're renting or uh, whether you're paying a, a mortgage that you live in, if you're renting, then you're money's paying off somebody else's mortgage, right? They're using. So that's money going to a bank. Uh, then you have uh, another 15, 16% going off to consumer credit card debt or, or a student loan or auto loan. You know, it's, uh, I mean, the auto loan, it, it's just the way our society is structured. I mean, the auto loan. I mean, you, you have to drive a certain distance to commute because uh, uh, auto manufacturers conspired with tire and uh, manufacturers in the oil sector to basically lobby against public transportation early on in this country's history. And, uh, and uh, generous tax breaks are given to uh, real estate developers, which leads to urban sprawl, so we're forced to lengthy commutes, so you have to get a car. So you, know, you have another 15% going to pay off that, and then another 16% for payroll tax. So about a third of your pay is for consumer spending. And then people sit back and say, where's the consumer aggregate demand? It's weak as heck, you know, and it's just, uh, that's why our economy seems stagnant and shitty. So we're, we're paying off our banking masters that basically have put a toll on over us, but that's the effect of the growth of uh, financial uh, capital. Uh, but uh, let me get a little fact more on track regarding uh, other damage that hedge funds have done. Ah, let me get back to my bullet points here. Apologize about that. Um, how corporate executive decisions are influenced by hedge fund managers. Well, I mentioned that earlier with Dan Lowe, you know, that he liked to personally bitch at the hedge fund manager. Actually, I came across a story in New Yorker about uh, Pirate Capital, which was a hedge fund management company that also had a, uh, the fund manager had a similar abusive behavior. Uh, he, uh, one of his biggest holdings at that uh, several years ago was a company that also managed prisons. It was later on bought by Geo Corp. And uh, at a conference call at a board meeting, uh, the hedge fund manager was saying to the CEO of the company, who missed a few quarterly earnings in a row, uh, you know, next year I'm going to be here, but you're not. You know, so you have this you know, outside pressure for the CEOs to perform. But even if that abuse wasn't there, I mean, they still keep a steady eye on their stocks. So, for example, the CEO of uh, ExxonMobil or some company uh, similar industry who's worried about the fate of the world regarding global warming, assuming he did care, uh, can't really do anything about it. Because if he does, anything that could impact short-term earnings, it can potentially hurt the price of his stock. And he's out of a job.
So the very structure of the institutions itself, the institutions of capitalism, keep us on this, you know, make, they pretty much make sure we stay on this uh, destructive course. You know, you know, we don't have this choice. Uh, hedge fund manager, oops, sorry. Oh, I should, yeah, yeah, I probably should wrap up. I was just gonna, uh, I guess uh, a few more things about hedge funds and the damage they've done. Uh, and then I'll, then I'll stop. Uh, uh, one good example of damage at current hedge funds, there's a class of hedge funds called uh, uh, quant funds, and there's a class of those uh, which do what's called high frequency trading. And they have uh, massive computers that basically look to do trades nanoseconds before, say, a retail investor or some other institutional investor places a trade and they basically buy and sell that stock instantaneously, increasing the cost to the ultimate buyer of that stock. So it's almost like scalping for pennies, right? Increasing the cost artificially. So for people that depend on, say, 401ks for retirement, which that's kind of a false joke too, that's another story, uh, their returns are diminished by this practice of high frequency trading. And these funds that specialize in high frequency trading, they hire brilliant mathematicians, theoretical physicists, people that would be contributing more useful knowledge uh, to our society. That, that labor drain is taken out and to create elaborate gambling schemes for these people. So it's, it's kind of crazy. Um, and another example of, uh, is uh, naked shorting, which is a bizarre practice that uh, takes advantage of, uh, of a loophole in stock delivery times, but you know, there's a, you can do what's called shorting a stock. You, it's the opposite of buying high, buying low and selling high. You sell it high and buy it back low. In other words, you borrow the stock that you don't have, sell it at a high price, then cover your position and so forth. And you open up what's called a margin account to do this. Uh, with naked shorting, they're sort of doing this, but they're not delivering the stock and they're closing on their trades before they do. It's actually an illegal process, but it's been shown that a number of hedge funds have been able to do it and get away with it because they're prime brokers, which of course are based on the largest of investment banks like Goldman Sachs and so forth, have managed to do these trades offshore. It creates massive selling volume of a stock uh, that's pretty much artificial but they've been able to target a number of companies, drive their stock down, make a lot of money on the way down, never have to really deliver the shares, and they've been getting away with it. It's been estimated that a thousand, over a thousand small companies were destroyed this way over the past decade, costing 1.2 million jobs, you know. So I mean, you, know, you look at these guys and these guys, they were job creators. It's like, really? You know, uh, <laughs> you know, it's uh, not really, you know, but uh, uh, I could go on and on. No. But.